Good morning. It's 8.30 on Thursday, September 15th. I'm Desiree Frazier, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, Jackson's water quality has been in the headlines for weeks due to poor water quality. But a 2021 lawsuit claims the water system has been dangerous for children for years. Then how one Mississippi County's residents opted back into the state's medical marijuana program, plus the Public Service Commission announces new energy cost saving initiatives. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Jackson residents are in their seventh week under a boil water notice, but concerns over water quality and safety have existed for years. Last fall, lawyers representing 1,800 children filed suit against the city and a number of state officials over dangerous levels of lead in the city water system. Attorney Corey Sturm with the firm Levi Konigsberg represents those clients and has expertise litigating these issues. He was the architect of the $626 million Flint water settlement. So are these issues related, and what is the path forward for the children he represents? Stern tells our Michael Guidry. They're related, and they're not related because lead caused the current crisis. They're related because mismanagement of the water utility for decades, not training the staff properly, not updating the utility Uh, in ways that it needed to be updated, failing to respond to environmental protection agency notices of violations of the lead and copper rule. All of those things lead to one conclusion that the people managing the water utility were not capable of it, and the water utility had therefore been mismanaged for decades. Mismanagement of a water utility leads to lead in the water, and mismanagement of a water utility leads to the utility itself not being prepared when there's a terrible storm or when the weather can have significant impacts on on a utility's ability to function. So the current crisis is a result of the same failures that caused my clients to file lawsuits almost a year ago having been exposed to high levels of lead in their drinking water. And what is the status of that lawsuit? And is this a class action lawsuit or are you individually in your firm individually individually representing uh, these 1,800 or so children? We represent each of those kids in their individual capacities, uh, not a class action. And the reason for that is when you're dealing with brain damage and kids, Not every kid is harmed the same way. Not every kid has the same potential as their brother or sister or neighbor. And class actions are generally designed to treat people who are similarly injured in similar ways. While these kids may be injured because of the same water, their injuries are significantly different between and amongst them. So they're all individuals. In terms of the status of the cases, the like every litigation that involves governmental entities, at least the litigations that I've been involved with over 20 years, it is almost always the truth that defendants in these cases, so the city of Jackson, the state of Mississippi, private entities who have been sued, like Trilogy Engineering, um, they have filed their motions to get the case dismissed based on uh, the way the complaints were filed based on the language that's that's included in the allegations against them. We have responded to those motions uh, and filed our responses with the court. And now we will at some point, hopefully in the very near future, have the opportunity to argue our respective positions before uh, the Honorable uh, Judge Reeves in the in, in, in the federal court. And my expectation is he will decide not to dismiss the cases, uh, as you know, was true in Flint with Judge Levy in the federal court, and as is true in most situations like this. And then we will begin the process of taking depositions, exchanging documents, answering questions that are required under the law, and we'll be litigating the cases until such time as uh, we get all the information that we need, and the defendants get all the information that they need, and Judge Reeves, Judge Reeves will hopefully set the case for a trial at some point in time, and, and we'll take the opportunity then to try a case or five or ten against the defendants who are in the case to determine 
with a jury, you know, by a jury, whether they are liable to to our clients for their injuries by way of their conduct over the course of, of years, if not decades. How many of your your clients from the uh, initial suit that uh, was filed in the at the end of 2021 remain residents of Jackson? Have any of them moved? Um, I'd say 95 percent of them. It's not a. I mean, there's not an exact science, but most of them can't move. Uh, you know, it's, this is a it's a relatively impoverished community. It's very difficult for people who live anywhere to just pack up and and leave. You have family roots, you have schools for your kids, and it always takes some financial wherewithal to do that. And unfortunately, the same thing was true in Flint. I mean, a lot of people would like to leave, but they can't afford it. And part and parcel with that is Jackson, just like Flint, is is a city of pretty proud residents, people who are from Jackson, feel strongly about their community, have a mom that lived here, a dad that lived here, a grandma, a grandpa that lived here, great grandparents that lived here, and it's it's not as easy as just packing up stuff and taking off when you have deep roots in a community, despite some of the troubles that the community is suffering, and when you probably can't afford to do it in a meaningful way. Not to mention the other factors that even if you had the money and even if you didn't have the foundational pieces of family and community. Moving kids from one school to another, moving your family from one town that you're familiar with to another or even to a different state, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. And when you're not getting information as transparently as you could from city officials and state officials about something like the safety of your water, by the time you realize as a resident of the city how bad things are, it's often too late. And so moving now while it might mitigate some of the issues uh, that these folks are facing, it's not going to change what has already happened to their kids. You can't move to a different city and undo brain damage caused by lead and drinking water. So the reality is is it needs to get fixed. It needs to get fixed or else people are going to be injured even more than they already have been. And that brings us to the kind of this, this final, final question that kind of that puts it all together, uh, and, and that you know the, the the spotlight has been on Jackson in the last couple of weeks due to an extended boil water notice, uh, and during a period uh, of that time, many residents in the city were without water pressure at all. Uh, but your suit and the clients you you represent uh, contend that boil water advisory or no boil boil water advisory, the water in the Jackson water system is unsafe. So, what are you hearing from them? Now, um, as as the city kind of comes under the spotlight with the with poor water quality being being the core issue, just immense anger and frustration. Um, you know the way the way folks in government react to a problem is oftentimes way worse than the problem itself. Really, what people want is just honesty. They just want the people in charge of whatever they're in charge of to be honest about what's happening. And I don't believe that any of my clients are nearly as angry about the quality of their water as they presently are about having been lied to about their water for so many years. I mean, when we when we first filed the case, I was confronted with a video from another reporter of the, the mayor of Jackson saying that this isn't an issue, that these are just lawyers who are greedy, who are coming into Jackson, and your water is safe. There's no issue with the water. I I don't take offense to what anybody thinks of the profession of law or of me personally, but I take great offense to public officials making comments publicly that they know to be false, and if they don't know that they're false, they shouldn't be speaking at all nor should they be in the positions of power that they're in. So overall, the the sentiment amongst this community and amongst our clients is just anger and frustration and sadness. Part of it is about not having good, clean water, but the majority of it is about just being lied to for, for months and years by the folks that they voted for, or even if they didn't vote for, by their elected officials. Attorney Corey Stern, who represents Jackson residents uh, in a lawsuit regarding uh, lead in the Jackson tap water. Corey, thank you so much for taking some time, uh, and we appreciate your perspective. It's my pleasure. 
Coming up, how one Mississippi County's residents opted back into the state's medical marijuana program. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. What can you do with the MPB Radio app? Listen live, hear local news, view the schedule, make a contribution, listen to shows on demand, and interact with social media. Get the app for your smartphone now. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Officials in Lincoln County elected to opt out of the state's new medical marijuana program earlier this year. But last month, residents overruled their decision thanks to a provision in the Mississippi Medical Cannabis Act. Jason McDonald is a Lincoln County resident who was active in the Stop the Opt campaign. He shares more with MPB's Rhonda Dunaway. On March 31st, uh, our Board of Supervisors opted out, and uh, pretty much the very next week, we started the organization, and we raised funds and collected signatures, and so by the end of June, so less than three months later, we had enough signatures, and so on, I believe, the July 5th meeting, our circuit clerk brought the result or brought the petition to the Board of Supervisors and they had to set a date for the election no less than 45 days but no more than 60 days from that date so they chose August 30th and we had our election so we you know, ran the campaign got the word out did education and uh, we ended up winning uh, 184 votes <laughs> it, you know it was a very low turnout but um, I think 12% of our population came out, but we did have enough votes, and um, those got presented, and we've now opted back in. Well, I was going to ask you, so this is the county, right? Right. This is the county. So, yeah, our interesting situation was it's sort of like beer and liquor. Uh, It's the same process, so a lot of people were kind of mad thinking this was just marijuana, but it's the same process that um, occurred when the counties were opting in and out about being dry or wet. And so there's a very interesting situation here in Lincoln County where Brookhaven is, has liquor and beer, and Brookhaven is a dry county. And so that's how they were trying to do it with medical cannabis, too. Um, now, that set up a very precarious situation here because the cards for being prescribed are a state-issued card. Therefore, the citizens out in the county could still possess, uh, use, transport through the county as long as they had the card. It just really kind of stopped farmers and growers from being able to grow or process. Um, you know, And so we didn't want to have competing laws between the city and the county because we feel when there's a gray area things can kind of go sideways. (laughs) So we just wanted to make it even across the board. When you were talking uh, to the people out there and getting, uh, you know, signatures on your petition, you you were, would I be right to say that you were doing a lot of dispelling of myths? Can you speak to that, uh, dispelling myths and educating people? Oh, sure. Yeah, we we put out a series of infographics, everything from, you know, what type of, you know, advertising, you know, there's no advertising whatsoever that can be done on any media. You can't even do buy one, get one specials or do even, you know, discount cards because that would be incentivizing it. Everybody has to have FBI background checks. There can't be signs anywhere. Yeah, I mean, but we put these infographics out so that people didn't think it was just going to be fields and fields of marijuana for the world to see. Um, and for the people that took the time to have an open mind and actually hear it, you know, I think they they listened and they realized what was going on. And, you know, there's some people that just weren't listening. 
Um, there are some people that are sad that it isn't fields of you know, marijuana growing. I mean, like, so, <laughs> but, you know, it's going to be anything new is going to be scary. There's only so many hours in the day, and I, you know, and but part of this is the education of everything. But the way we see it is everybody's up in arms right now, or some people are up in arms right now. But in three years, nobody's going to be paying attention to anything. I mean, it's yeah. just going to be a metal building or a greenhouse in the back of a field behind a fence somewhere. All right. Well, um, is there anything else that we should know? Um about um, the medical mar- uh, medical marijuana law or um, ma- opting back in process before I uh, let you go? I, you know, I don't really, I think we've thoroughly covered the opt-in process. But again, you know, the, the Department of Health uh, website has a wonderful set of guidelines, easy to use. You can look to see the rules, the regulations. You know, it, it's nothing to be scared of. The information's there. Um, the other part is this is this is for medical. This is not recreational, so you do have to have a doctor. You do have to have a prescription. Like I said, it's, you can't do telehealth, and you have to have a one of the 22 conditions that Mississippi has put on it to be able to be prescribed. It, and it's you know, I think sometimes we get wrapped up in and the fact that, oh, something's prescribed versus not. And it's like, look, there, there's way more dangerous medicine sitting in your counties and have been at drugstores. And we figured out how to safely administer those. Now, does that mean that people don't abuse them? You know, sure, that, and that's going to happen. And I'm not going to say that people will never abuse the system, but it's the very best system we can come up with, and it's a system that's been used for years for very deadly substances. Jason McDonald is a Lincoln County resident. Coming up, the Public Service Commission announces new energy cost-saving initiatives. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, is a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family. To find out what we're all about, subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB public media app. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. It's made possible in part by contributions from podcast listeners. Please consider making a contribution by going to the Donate Now tab at mpbonline.org. Thanks for your financial support. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. A new initiative by the state's largest energy provider could help lower the cost being passed to customers. Natural gas prices have been subject to sharp increases over the past year, causing electricity costs to surge, including here in Mississippi. The cost savings program is part of a $300 million settlement between Entergy and the Public Service Commission over accounting practices at the Grand Gulf Nuclear Station. Commissioner Brandon Presley of the Northern District tells our Kobe Vance, the settlement has already provided customers a one-time bill credit of $80. He's pleased to see corporate responsibility in action. Well, I think this can mean a great deal of savings at a time in which inflation is kicking every Mississippian in the teeth, whether it be although gas at the pump's coming down some, uh, groceries are still up. These are direct funds that are going to help lower the cost of living for Mississippians. And it's a great example of corporate responsibility, understanding that we've all got to chip in at a time like this uh, to get through. And so I applaud Entergy's uh, willingness on their shareholders uh, from their own dollars to invest to try to help people keep the lights on and reduce their cost at home. What's going on behind the scenes to make sure this is possible? Well, we've worked hard over the last couple of months to institute a historic $300 million settlement with the company on on different litigation we had handing out, uh, outstanding that were already has reduced bills by $80 uh, and as an $80 bill credit. This adds to that. This makes that even more impactful. And so we're going to continue to push, recognizing that regulators and uh, the utilities have got to be proactive in how they look at the rising costs and we make sure that we're helping customers at every point. What would be your 
uh, advice to Mississippians right now when it comes to dealing with these higher costs of energy prices? Well, realize that consumption does drive costs. Uh, and so if there are ways in which Mississippians uh, can save energy at home, not use as much, obviously we need to do that. Secondly is if you would qualify for some of these federal funds, uh, reach out to the Public Service Commission or Entergy or their local electric provider and ask for that help. We are turning back tens of millions of dollars that shouldn't be going back to the federal government because it's here to help Mississippians. And last question I had for you is, uh, the Sacrely actually alluded to investments being made in nuclear as well as solar energy in Mississippi. What are your thoughts on the future in terms of energy consumption and how having these alternative sources of energy? Well, the key point is to keep the lights on. Uh, but we're seeing significant investments in both renewable energy but also upgrades in traditional like nuclear power plants. We've got to take a balanced approach. We, we don't need an extreme energy policy in either direction. Uh, but working moderately and practically with the utilities is going to be a key to keep the lights on and keep the cost down. Public Service Commissioner Brandon Presley with our Kobe Vance. This new program called Operation Bill Assist is a $3.2 million project that offers bill assistance and promotes energy efficiency. Haley Versackley is president and CEO of Entergy Mississippi. He says natural gas costs have increased around 400 percent since 2019. Our customers, like most Mississippians and even our employees, we're feeling the impacts of higher energy costs, inflation, uh, post-pandemic uh, impacts and all of that. And so we're trying to be proactive to let our customers know the bills are going to be increasing because of high natural gas. Natural gas is responsible for almost 60 percent of the electricity we generate and is a pass-through expense. So we want to get out and make these programs available to help our more vulnerable Mississippians, those who need additional assistance, but also educate Mississippians on steps they can take to reduce their electric bills. When it comes to this funding that's available now, how much of it is passive, as in like they, people have to actually go out of their way to get to have it help them, and how much of it is going to be something that they could have to seek out, but also have that assistance firsthand? Well, these particular programs are are a one-time offering, and we've never done anything like this. So the details about how they apply for it will be available. Uh, The passive things that they're going to see is what I mentioned about what we're doing on the supply chain. We've made significant investments in Grand Gulf, our nuclear power plant that uses nuclear energy. That is our lowest fuel uh, source available, so we're making it more reliable and run into the future. And we have made an announcement to invest in 1,000 megawatts of solar, which will diversify our fuel mix and lessen uh, fuel costs such as natural gas going forward to help our customers too. So that's a long-term passive uh, uh, benefit our customers will see. I believe you all also have the level billing option. Yeah, so one of our most popular programs that I uh, is available to any customer who's been a customer more than a year And they take uh, your average customer bill over a a course of a year and average it out over each month. In the summer, usage is high, and customers are getting hot hit with high bills. I use it. I like it because it 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 helps you set a budget for the year, and you know what your average cost is each month. Very popular program. Haley Fazakali is president and CEO of Energy Mississippi. This has